Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Richard Faulkner. I'm a professor of military history at the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College here at beautiful Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And today we're going to talk about the evolution of military small arms, basically from the dawn of the gunpowder age nearly to the present day. Now, as we talked about in our earlier classes, there's something in the human psyche when it comes to weapons. We're always searching for that next best thing that lets us better kill our, mother, our fellow man. Now, when it comes to gunpowder weapons, we're going to start pretty basic. Sometime around uh, the mid-8th to 9th century A.D., we know that gunpowder originates in China. And it makes a slow, torturous path to Europe. The first actual recipe that we have in Western Europe uh, for gunpowder comes from 1267, from an Englishman named Roger Bacon. And of course, gunpowder is a, is a fine mix of potassium nitrate, saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. Now, when the Chinese came up with these weapons, what do they do with them? What do they do with gunpowder? Okay, so they do fireworks. How about militarily? So what are they doing with it? Okay, so they have fire arrows that explode. Are they making cannons? Yes, absolutely. They're even making handguns. But when you look at Chinese society, especially at this time, how important is gunpowder to Chinese warfare? Well, not very. Okay? It's a relatively stable period of Chinese history, so the need's not there. There's also some social imperatives, things like Taoism, that are sort of mitigating against putting these nasty, unstable things inside society. When gunpowder reaches Europe in the high Middle Ages, what are the Europeans up to? War. How often? Go ugly, go early, go often, right? So this is constant warfare with the Europeans. And so while, you know, gunpowder weapons are not necessarily as important when you go to the east, when you get to Europe, everything's right for a rapid development. Now, of course, the first thing that the Europeans do with gunpowder, same thing the Chinese. You go big. You go with cannons. But then quickly you start to miniaturize. So the world's first gunpowder weapons are these handguns, G-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. that that, that's where that term comes from. We're also known as hand cannons. And let's face it, it doesn't get any more basic than that. It's nothing more than an iron or a brass barrel on a stick. Pretty basic stuff. You got a big hole here. You drop in some gunpowder, and that's what you're doing, dropping in some gunpowder. You're putting in the ball. It is a smooth bore. You are tapping the ball down. You are then putting a little bit of gunpowder here in the touch hole, and you have a slow match. It's basically a rope that's been sunk, been uh, seeped in saltpeter, so it'll burn, hopefully, at a constant rate of about an inch an hour. You then point this in the general direction of the enemy, and you do this. Why do you do it that way? because it's just as likely to blow up and kill you as it is to hurt the other guy, okay? Out of the beginning, small beginnings, great things grow. Now, I will tell you, there's probably a problem with this weapon, especially if you're doing this. It lacks a little bit of accuracy. It's a short one weapon, but the good news is, at these short ranges, the power that's created by this gunpowder will actually penetrate chain mail, and at the right angles and the right ranges also go through plate armor. Now, from there, things rapidly start to develop. And from these beginnings, and the first one of those hand cannons that we have an actual copy of comes from Cannonburg Castle. And we know that that castle was destroyed in 1399, so the hand cannon is right around that period. Within about a hundred years, you start to develop something that looks like this, the matchlock. Okay, now this is a trick question. They call it a matchlock because... It has a match. There we go. We can't pull anything over. Now, the good musketeer will have a couple of accoutrements. You will have the match or the musket. You will also have the bandolier belt. This is sometimes called an apostle belt because there are 12 of these little bottles. 
Each one of these bottles contains enough powder for a single shot. You'll also have a small bag to carry the balls, and then you'll have a little uh, uh, flask here for smaller priming powder. Now, the other thing that comes with this is a rest. So by the time you're getting to the early 1500s, this is what your infantry guys are starting to carry in increasing numbers. And this will start to dominate the battlefields for about 100 years. So roughly from the middle of the 1500s up through nearly the end of the 1600s, this is going to be your infantry weapon. Now, it's a relatively convoluted way of loading and firing. You have to have the rest because your average European is about this tall and the musket is much taller and heavier. So to load and fire this, the first thing you do is remove the match. The match is burning at both ends because it's always embarrassing in battle to have your match go out. Okay? Then old Sarge yells at you and has to restart it. You put that in your off hand. We'll see here why in a minute. You then cast the weapon about. You take one of these vials. You pour in the powder. You then take out the ball and drop it in. This match lock is 75 caliber, roughly 12 gauge. The ball you're firing is going to be about 70 caliber. Smooth bore rolls right on down. If necessary, you take out the scouring stick and tap it down. You then replace this, put it back on your rest, open up the pan, take out your priming powder, pour enough in to cover up the pan, replace this. You're seeing where I'm going with this, right? And then, on order, you open the pan, you, you close the pan up, you take the match, blow on it because you need a nice big amber, you reseat it into the jaw, you test to make sure that when you pull the trigger it's going to hit the pan, and then on order you open, give fire. That's where that comes from. Huh. Do you think there's any problem with this weapon system? Okay. First and foremost, this is weather dependent. If it's cold, if it's rainy, if there's a little bit of spit and snow around there, big stick, no go, boom. Okay? Any other problem? It is slow. That if you go through all of these steps, you're going to be lucky if you get off one round a minute. Keep that in mind. One round a minute. Any other problem? Go ahead. That's right. So combat resupply, you're going into battle, that's your combat load. 12 rounds is going to be hard to resupply. Uh, I said this is a 75 caliber weapon and the ball you're firing is 70 caliber. Problem? You're going to lose a lot of power. And when this thing fires, that ball just sort of zigzag down the barrel since it's much smaller. And wherever it happens to be zigging or zagging when it leaves the muzzle is the general direction in which it goes, which tells you... Yeah, this, you're not going to hit a man-sized target outside about 75 to 85 meters. So we've got a weapon that has some limitations. Oh, by the way, you know what you call this in the 1600s? A suicide bomber vest. I've got a lot of black powder. I've got a lit match. And if those two things come into contact, it's a bad day. So when we look at this weapon system, there are a host of problems associated with it. And in fact, at the same time that these weapons are being developed, there are a lot more effective weapon systems out there. Now, how many guys like Braveheart? How many guys have seen the movie? Okay, so everybody's seen Braveheart, okay? Braveheart. Now, what do those battle scenes look like in that movie? Okay, they look chaotic. They look gruesome. How's old Braveheart doing? William Wallace. When they actually come to the battle scenes, what's happening? He's dominating, right? So Big Will Wallace, or actually little Mel Gibson, and his big sword is out there hacking and slashing, right? There goes an arm. There goes a leg. And he's hacking and slashing. And how long are those battles going on for 
like hours, right? And at the end, how's old Braveheart doing? Oh, he's still a hacking and a slashing, right? Now, do you know what a real medieval battlefield would look like after the first 10 minutes? This. <laughs> oh, why? Okay. What's driving this puppy? Your guns, baby. Not gunpowder, this stuff. Any problem with that? <laughs> yeah, you get tired, right? So just a little bit, even though these knights, these guys are training their whole lives to do this, there are limits to human endurance. Big guys with armor, slinging around big weapons, you've got a problem. Keep that in mind. Now let's get to some of the other weapon systems that are out there. Our matchlock is getting off one round a minute at a whopping rate or a whopping range of about 75 to 85 meters. We have this thing, the English longbow. Now, this is the hunting version of this. Okay? Now, an English longbow in the hand of a trained archer will be able to get out 10 rounds a minute and hit targets consistently at at least 200 meters. At the close range, at the right interval, these arrows with the bodkin points Nasty little sharp points will absolutely go through chainmail, which tends to be the majority of the armor being worn at that period, and at close range, and at the right angle, will also go through plate armor. Hmm. So I have a weapon system that is a heck of a lot more efficient than that matchlock. And I have another one. This is a Flemish crossbow. Same idea, you're using the bow power here, but this thing can fire at least eight or so bolts per minute, and it's also going to have some pretty good penetrating power at 150, 200 meters. So why is it, my friends, that when we generally suppose that best technology is what you stay with, that these things quickly disappear off the battlefield while my old friend the matchlock survives. Ah, so let's think about this. Where are my bow guys? Where are my bow hunters? Okay. If you don't mind me asking, sir, what is the pull of your bow? You got a 70? I got a 55 pound. Okay, now all these bows that have all those pulleys and stuff on them. So it could be, you know, pulled back by a prepubescent little, little girl or boy. I'm just, okay, I'm not, not judging. I'm just saying, okay. If you're going to get a target and smack a target at 200 meters, the English longbow, a little bit, war bow's a little bit taller than this, over six foot tall, it has a 100 to 120 pound straight pull. So when you lift it in one steady move, you bring it back all the way to your ear and release. And the amount of pressure that is in that bow is going to launch that thing. And then you're going to get another one and you're going to do it again. And you're going to get it to where you 10 of them in a minute. Now let's have some fun. Come on up. Just, just, yeah, just come on up. You look like a big, strong man. And now very gently, I want you to take this. And I want you to, in one steady movement, pull it back to your ear. Because that's where you've got to go. Uh, 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 hold, hold. How you doing? How you feeling? How's life? Oh, okay, we better release it then, right? Is that pretty hard? Yeah. That's a 45-pound pull. 45 pounds. So, let, let's have, ah, 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 but there's more. Now, what I need you to do with this one is that you put your foot in here, okay? Then you grab hold of the string both ways, leap that against your chest, and I need you to pull it back till it locks here, okay? And don't break it because that's mine. Uh, it doesn't, because I, I fixed it to where it wouldn't. Is that, is that pretty hard? Well, that's easier because you've got a little bit more leverage on it using both hands. Okay. I feel like uh, that would probably be easier than a long bow. Okay, but this is only a 130-pound pull because it is easier to pull back. Most of the ones you're using in combat are 120, or, or correction, 200 pounds. Okay? Thanks, brother. Yep. Uh, 
But just pulling out that 45 pounds, did you have some problems? Um, I, I can say, yeah. I remember in the middle of combat, I'm sure it was good. Okay. If you're going to have an archer who can hit targets at 200 meters and get 10 of those arrows out in a minute, when do you start training? Yeah, when they're six or seven. Okay? When do you stop? When you stop being an archer, right? Okay, when you stop being an archer. Uh, what happens if you take two weeks off and go to medieval MHIC? <laughs> what happens when you get back? Yeah, they ain't no medieval Ben Gay, because this is going to stink, right? In fact, they actually put this in English law that every yeoman, every person who is eligible for military service is required to go and work out at the butts, work out at shooting the arrows. This takes a lot of muscles to pull this off, okay? You start training young. You don't stop because it's hard to pick back up. It requires so much musculature that even today when they excavate medieval cemeteries, they know who the longbowmen are because the shoulder blades are actually distorted. Huh. Hey, what happens if you have a bad day in combat? And say those French guys with these sticky pointy things get into all of your archers. When are you getting more? Yeah, you, you send a message back to England, you know, ye all get busy. And if you're lucky, in 16 years you get a new archer, right? What we start to see here with this gunpowder revolution are the inherent limitations of muscle, muscle warfare. That before this, you had to devote a lot of time and energy to mastering arms. How much strength does it take to fire that matchlock? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? There we go. So when you start looking at this, even though these other weapon systems are much more effective, at the end of the day, gunpowder weapons democratize warfare. I don't need knights that do all their life in training. I do not need archers that spend all their life in training. I can take that matchlock and give me a day of training, I can teach all of you how to fire it without hurting yourselves. Give me a couple of weeks, I can teach you how to hurt others and actually start moving together. So the size of these armies start to expand rapidly. But the inherent problems with this weapon, though, that lack of reliability, the fact that it's not all weather, the fact that it's taken too many steps to load, are ultimately going to slowly but surely ease it off the battlefield starting in the mid-1600s. Now, you've got a couple of intermediate steps. One of them is this, the wheel lock. Now, sometimes people say, well, uh, Leonardo da Vinci had a hand in this. Yeah, yeah, he had some real weird drawings. But we know that the clockmakers of Nuremberg, Germany, probably had a lot to do with creating this. Because if you look at some of the works here, they look a lot like clockworks. Let's get rid of that burning match and replace it with some other ignition system. What the wheel lock does is you have a spanner. You cock the weapon, span the weapon, and in the jaws here you have iron pyrite. And the idea is when you put that iron pyrite down on that spinning wheel, when you release it, it creates a shower of sparks that then goes inside the pan, the pan fires, sets off the charge inside the chamber. Pretty cool. Okay? Believe it or not, this is the first weapon of political assassination. Because I can load it, I can cock it, I can hide it. Uh, one of the first political assassinations done with this is William the Silent of uh, the Netherlands. Which means that some of the kings and queens actually don't want this technology to get out. But this is something that's actually good for horsemen. You know, horsemen, you're bouncing around with a match, that's bad. I can go ahead and have these things ready. The problem is, that's very expensive. And it requires a lot of work to make it. It also is very persnickety. Okay, the first time I took it out and fired it, I broke it, and I had to fix it. Okay, so, and, and I'm a technological guy from the 21st century. When you get soldiers, that's a problem. 
But the idea is here, a different ignition system. So by the time you get to the mid-1600, another weapon system is starting to come and dominate the battlefields. Its replacement is the flintlock. You'll notice that the accoutrements start to change. The flintlock, again, is called a flintlock because you got a little piece of flint now that serves as the ignition. You, you've got the idea from the wheel lock, but you simplify it quite a bit. So, pretty easy. I take flint, I have steel. When flint makes steel, it creates a shower of sparks. There's some other innovations that come out with this too. Starting with uh, Gustavus Adolphus and William of Nassau, you get rid of all those apostle belts and you go to something that's a little bit more simple. You change the cartridge. So on one hand you've got the powder, on the other hand you've got the ball. You get rid of the apostle belts, you replace it with a nice, big, sturdy leather buy. That means it's relatively waterproof. To load and fire this weapon, I'm going to simplify the process. Depending on the drill manual you used, it took 45 separate and distinct steps to fire the matchlock. I'm going to get this down to about 14. First thing, I take out the cartridge. The soldier takes the ball between their teeth and tears. Funny thing about these armies, at this time infantrymen had to have two teeth, one facing down, one facing up. Some things never change. Okay. You put the weapon on half cock. That's the safety. Have you ever heard the term, don't go off half cock? That's where it comes from. The soldier holding the ball between their teeth, tearing the cartridge, will then put just enough powder inside the pan to cover it up. They'll close the pan, that'll keep the powder in there. They'll cast the weapon about, pour the powder in, drop the ball in, and if necessary, ram it back home. Now, since I have simplified the steps, I'm now able to fire this weapon at least three times a minute. So I've tripled the rate over the match lock. Freddie the Great's army, Frederick the Great's army, trains and is so disciplined to the point that they can actually get off for a surge rate of fire five rounds a minute. Hmm. But there's more. This is a weapon system. If you look at the armies of the Thirty Years' War, if you look at the army of the English uh, Civil War, you'll notice there's a mix in the infantry. You have musketeers, but you also have pikemen. And the pikes are about 16 to 18 foot long, and they're to pri provide the shot. And you got guys shoulder to shoulder, but the problem with those pikes is they're very unwieldy. So in Europe, they start figuring out how to put firepower and shock power together without all the unwieldiness of the pikes. The solution comes with a little town of Bayonne. And Bayonne, they come up with the bayonet. And the first bayonets are just like this. They're plug bayonets because they plug right into the muzzle. So now I have my shock and firepower. Any problem with this design, though? <laughs> yeah, I can stabity-stab, I can shooty-de-shoot. And when every army, there's Gomer Pyle who will try to do both, right? And if you try to do both, that's bad. Uh, of course, that's sort of light in there, so if you're not careful, it falls out. But the idea is now there. And by the end of the 1600s, the French, who were leading in a lot of these designs, come up with a socket bayonet. Now I want you to take a look at this blade. Notice anything? It's a triangular bayonet. Why? People suck. Yes. You come up to the realization pretty early that if I stab you with a blade weapon and if I don't hit you anywhere vital, you can put your hand over that wound and keep from bleeding out. With a triangular bayonet, it rips and it tears as it goes through. It creates a puncture wound. And even today, hospitals have a hard time dealing with puncture wounds. It just uh, creates a lot of medical problems. And of course, in a time before antibiotics and with nasty bodies, you're almost giving a guy a death sentence if you're stabbing him with his thing. And the tactic are going to start to evolve to match the reality of this weapon. 
Now I can load and I can fire. But I got to be careful, right? Ow, 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 but I can do it. Now, are there inherent problems even with my flintlock? Okay, it's still not all weather. I've made it better, but on a wet day, this is not going to fire. Hey, what is flint? And what are you doing with that rock? You are bashing it up against a piece of steel. Funny thing about these flints, they have to have a pretty sharp point to get the, the, uh, the amount of sparks you're going to need to set it off. The problem with a rock is you never know when it's going to dull on you. You never know when it's going to break. It can happen the first time you pull the trigger. It can happen the hundredth time you pull the trigger. But sooner or later, you're going to have to replace that. And the battlefield is probably not the place you want to do it. Now, because of the fact that it's still not completely waterproof and you've got an inherent problem with the ignition system, you have a misfire rate on this weapon of about 10%. So one in 10 times when you pull the trigger, the weapon doesn't fire. And when it comes to your tactical organizations to use this, though, you have to take some of the other limitations of the weapon into to account. This is a British Brown Bess. This weapon is first introduced by the British uh, in the 17-teens and will continue to equip their army through the 1840s. And if you look at the flintlocks themselves, it's one of the most successful weapon systems in military history. It's on the battlefield for over 200 years. But it's got problems. Just like the matchlock, it's still smoothbore. This is a 75 caliber weapon. The ball it fires is much smaller. Hey, what is the last command that the American commander at Bunker Hill gives his soldiers as the British are coming up the hill? Don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. Why? Because when I see the whites of your eyes, I know you're close. The Prussians have, drew, have been doing some experiments on this. In fact, there's an old saying in the Prussian army of Frederick the Great. He said, you get three shots, right? The first shot is for God, because only with divine intervention are you going to hit anything. The second shot is for the devil, because all you're doing is creating sulfurous smoke. The third shot, the third shot is for your king and paymaster. Make sure the third shot hits. During the time of the Napoleonic War, the Prussian army will take and start to do some tests on the effectiveness of this weapon system. They'll create a target that is six foot tall and 100 foot wide, about the frontage of an infantry regiment. Okay? And they're going to take 200 musketeers, and they're going to have them fire, volley fire, all together at that target at various ranges. At 200 meters, they have like a handful of shots, and that's a big target to hit on there. And it's not until they come to within 80 meters that half of the shots that they fire hit anywhere on that target. The guy who is going to have the advantage is the side that waits, that waits, that waits, then does a volley fire all together, and hopefully at that very close range, breaks the cohesion, breaks the leadership of the enemy formation, and once that's done, you close with them on the bayonet and run them off the field. This is an effective weapon. We come to think about modern technology and modern weapons of being much deadlier than the stuff that came behind. This is a cow bone, cow leg bone. Uh, my son hit this with a Charleville flintlock musket, smoothbore, from about 80 feet. There used to be more of it, but it shattered. And you will see as we pass it around, the musket ball is still embedded. And take a look at what that musket ball looks like. Because these black powder weapons, relatively low velocity, have incredible hydrostatic shock value. So if you get hit with one of these things, it's going to do some damage. Big ball moving slow. Now, of course, the question is accuracy. Humans generally want to be far away from danger as possible. Right? Just makes sense. And early on, in the 1500s, 
as people are experimenting with firearms technology, they start to discover if you cut grooves in the barrel, rifling, and you eliminate what they call windage, that difference between the bore and the barrel, it will impart a spin to the bullet, and the spin will increase range and to some extent will compensate with accuracy. And you have this rifle technology starting to uh, show up a little bit on the battlefield in the 1700s. This is a European Jaeger rifle. And Jaegers are specialized troops. Of course, in the United States, in the colonies, you'll have the Pennsylvania and the Virginia riflemen. But I want you to take a look when you have a chance of this bore. That's some pretty deep rifling. Now, to get this thing to work, you have to take that ball, because it's still a round ball, you have to encase it in linen or leather to get rid of the windage, and then you have to very carefully and laboriously push that ball down. Now, while you're pushing that ball down, you're getting off maybe one round a minute, and the musketeer is getting off three. And it's okay cool to be a Virginia rifleman and pop the redcoats out at 150, 200 meters. You'll notice there ain't no bayonet on this one because you don't want to screw up the rifling by making around with a piece of metal. It's cool also when they're at 125 meters. It starts to get sketchy when those guys are at 80 meters. The biggest problem with this early rifling is it requires over a thousand hand turns with a rifling machine to pull this off. You ever get a chance to go to Williamsburg, Virginia? They have a rifle shop with one of those things. A thousand turns. So they are expensive to make, and they're only for specialist soldiers. But the idea is there. Now, in England, in the second quarter of the 1700s, you get the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, you start to be able to mechanize some of these processes that were done before. And that's going to affect weapons technology. So we're going to try to start to address some of these problems that had come before. With automatic rifling machines driven by uh, water or steam power, now you don't have to worry about doing a thousand hand turns. You let the machine do it for you. So by the time you get to the 1850s, 1860s, most of the large armies of the world are starting to adopt rifles for everyone. But to make it easy, the big change comes, not necessarily with the technology, but as we'll see time and time again, with the projectile that you fire. This is a Springfield Civil War rifled musket. So this is the type of weapon, along with the, the British infield, are the muskets that equip the vast majority of the infantry on both sides of the American Civil War. Now you'll notice that this thing has all sorts of sights on it. It's got a long range sight, it's got a medium range peat sight, and you've got some other stair step sights. If you look at the flintlock, there are no sights because it's a mouse, point and click. I'm now going to give you another projectile to fire. Starting around in the 1840s, uh, the French, led by a man named Claude Minet, are going to start to experiment with the right type of rounds to use in these rifles. He goes with an elongated bullet rather than a ball. It's going to cut through the, uh, the air a little bit better. And by the time you get to the Civil War, it's going to be perfected to the degree that it now has a hollow lead base. So when I ram this thing down, this is a 58 caliber weapon. The round I'm firing is 5.77, so just slightly smaller. But to eliminate the windage, when the cartridge fires here in the chamber, that light metal base then quickly expands into the rifling and allowing it to spin. And the rifleman is now not getting off one round a minute, but the soldier is getting off three rounds a minute. There's also a change in the ignition system. In 1805, a Scottish clergyman named uh, Forsyth discovers that if you take mercury fulminate and hit it with something hard, like a hammer, it'll create a little explosion. And what he does is start to turn out these little musket caps. 
And with that musket cap, you will go with percussion cap ignition. So I get rid of the problem of flint and steel and the fact that that's going to break. Now the soldier takes the rifle, takes the cartridge, he puts the musket cap on the nipple, he still has to load it from the muzzle, but again, I can do this just as rapidly as I can on a smooth bore. I can get three rounds off a minute, and in theory, this weapon system can hit a man-sized target at 600 meters. I say in theory. Because if you're going to actually use this technology, what has to be there? Training. Training of who? The soldier and the officers and the NCOs. Hey, where do you get the majority of your soldiers in the American Civil War? They're the farmers, both north and south. They're not trained soldiers. Okay? Hey, where do your officers come from? We don't have aristocrats in America. Okay? They come from the notables, right? The, the local notables in the south, maybe some of the, the large planters. But again, these guys aren't trained soldiers. So I'm bringing all of these untrained men into the ranks, and they're being officered by, again, untrained folks. And what more recent scholarship from the last 30 years or so has shown is that unlike the myth, which is that the technology radically changes at the time of the Civil War, but the tactics don't change, and this failure to adjust means that the Civil War is bloody, what more recent scholarship has said is one of the reasons that the war is so dang bloody is you have these masses of guys, and since they're untrained, they don't engage at 600 meters. They wait until the Army's closed to about 80 to 120 meters. They stop and engage in a short-range firefight until one side or the other runs out of ammunition or breaks. And at 80 to 100 meters, you are basically not increasing the range that you did with a flintlock. Now, where are my Southerners? We've got a couple of Southerners here, right? I'm a Southerner. Now, of course, that did not apply to the sons of the South, because the sons of the South were born with rifles in their hands, which, of course, made birth hell on their mother. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, what made Southerners better marksmen? They are hunting. Hunting what? What would approximate a human target on the battlefield if you were hunting? Deer. deer. Here's the problem. The deer population of the Southeast had been depleted by the 1850s. It doesn't make a return until the 1950s. So when those Southerners are out shooting, what are they shooting? Squirrels. How do you shoot a squirrel? Yeah, well, if you can in the head, okay? The best way to shoot a squirrel, especially if you want some meat, is you get a shotgun. You get right underneath the tree and blam, blast him out, right? At point blank range. Hmm. As long as you have muzzle loaders, you're going to have some problems. I've been told that sometimes in combat, things get a little sketchy. And soldiers sometimes do not think through what they're doing. And there's some built-in problems with this weapon system, okay? Uh, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Here come the rebs, here come the rebs, here come the rebs, here come the rebs. Bam! Ooh, wait. If I forget to take out the ramrod, yeah, I'm going to get one guy. Thwop. And then what do I have? $16 government issue club. Eh. Or this is also what happens. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Tear, bullet, powder, ram, ram, ram. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I go bullet, powder, ram, 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 you know what happens? Nothing. Okay. Now wait, these are, these are technologically advanced Americans. That would never happen. One of these rifles recovered from the battlefield at Gettysburg had 23 rounds shoved down the muzzle. We've got a problem. It doesn't matter how cool the technology is if the soldiers and the officers aren't trained to use it to its max effectiveness. But you're also thinking of how to overcome that. If I can at least get rid of that whole muzzle loading thing, perhaps I can start to change the dynamics. And almost as long as there are firearms, there are attempts to make breech loaders. 
You open up the breech, you slap the cartridge in, you slap the powder in and the ball, and you fire. And by the time you get to 1848, there's an American named Christian Sharps with a Sharps rifle that pretty well perfects this. The problem with all these other early black powder breech loaders is, is getting that tight seal when you fire. So there's a bad tendency when you fire to have all this stuff go shooting up in your face, which tends to throw off your aim, I'm just saying. But at least the idea is there. If we can at least load through the breech, we will increase the rate of fire, but also cut down on Gomer pile in the ranks. That Sharps rifle, on its best day, can get about five rounds off a minute. So you are increasing the amount of rounds that the soldiers can send down range. However, there's still problems with the cartridge. The cartridges that you're using in these early breech loaders are nitrated paper and linen. In other words, you stick the whole cartridge in, and in theory it burns up. But they're very fragile. And fragility in war is a problem. But how about this? If we can change the bullet, we can actually make some big improvements on where we're going here. And in France, there's a guy named Flaubert who's experimenting with what will become known as the metallic cartridge. And there are Americans, two specific ones, Horace Smith and Daniel Wesson. Have you heard of them? Smith and Wesson, who ultimately in 1854 patented a good design for a metallic cartridge. In 1857, then they then start to mass produce it for pistols. In one handy dandy package, you have the bullet, you have the powder, and you have the primer. No fumbling around with percussion caps. And now that I have this weapon system, some pretty interesting things start to happen. The round comes first, the weapons come later. And you get two of them that happen very, very quick. There's a guy named Tyler Henry who works for the Volcanic Arms Company. He will later go to work when that company goes bust for a guy named Oliver Winchester. And he will take that 22 cartridge that Smith & Wesson developed and he'll put some steroids on it to make it into a rifle cartridge, make it big. And as these cartridges are getting bigger, other inventors are going to step into the fray. One of the guys is Christopher Spencer. And in 1860, he patents this, the Spencer rifle. And once you get a metallic cartridge, you can start doing some stuff like this. Make a magazine. This weapon has a seven-round magazine. You load it up. You put it in the butt of the weapon. Once it's in, it's easy to operate. You pull down on the trigger guard, that ejects any spent cartridge. You load it up, that loads the next one. You cock and you fire. On your worst day, you're going to get off seven rounds a minute. Most soldiers who are equipped with this weapon can then quickly load in at least three more and get off, on average, ten rounds a minute. Your average Civil War infantryman with a muzzle, load, with a muzzle loading rifle, three rounds a minute. I've tripled that rate. That's a lot of firepower going out. Tyler Henry, when he goes to work for that old boy Winchester, ultimately will come out with the Henry rifle. Now, this is a later Winchester version, but it's sort of the same idea. You load in the rounds underneath the, mag the, uh, the barrel, and he even fixes the ergo dynamics, right? One steady level, you pull down on the handle, Ejects the spent cartridge at the same time it cocks it. You don't even have to do that. Push it forward and fire. The first Henrys have a 15-round tubular magazine, plus you put one in the chamber, 16 rounds on your worst day a minute. Right? Both the Henry rifle and the Spencer are patented in 1860, a year prior to the start of the American Civil War. Oh, the South does not have the technology to make the cartridges. So even if they capture these things, they can't really use them. So why is it that when you have cool technology like this, the vast majority of Union infantrymen throughout the war are going to keep with this? Ah, where are my loggies? We got some loggies here, right? Any ordnance guys? Okay, that's good. Uh, there are some concerns here. The basic load for an infantryman in the Civil War with this weapon is 40 rounds. 
And it's very hard to do combat resustainment in the Civil War. So if I give Joe the capability of this weapon, seven rounds a minute, what's going to happen? If I give Joe the capability of blowing off that basic load in three and a half minutes, the fear is Joe's going to do it. So what happens if the battle goes on five minutes? Ooh, that's a problem. There are other problems, too. Part of it is cost. This weapon is $16. That includes the sling, the cartridge box, the bayonet, all the other Ginsu knife stuff that comes with it. The Spencer rifle comes in at about $30. The Henry rifle, $60. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when the average private is getting paid $16 a month, that's a lot of cash that would be going to equipping this army. So even though the technology is there, the actual metallic cartridge weapons have very little impact on the overall course of the Civil War. But the Army ultimately does like this idea of metallic cartridges. So after the war, it's still rejecting the repeaters, but it wants to adopt a metallic cartridge for everybody. And the weapon of choice throughout the American Indian Wars and for the National Guard up through the Spanish-American War and Philippine Insurrection is this, the trapdoor Springfield. Now, it's called a trapdoor simply because it's got a little trapdoor. It is 4570. That's a pretty big slug. It's pretty easy to operate, so it's easy to train. I take the rifle, the cartridge, I put it in, I close the breech, I cock the weapon, I fire. When I'm done, the spear ejects out. And really, it's just dependent on how quick the soldier can operate that to set your rate of fire. And most soldiers can still get off six, seven rounds a minute. Okay, pretty impressive. Now, here's a problem, though. This is the type of weapon in a carbine form that equips Custer's cavalry at the Little Bighorn. And what archaeologists discovered in the 1980s is while the cavalry guys were popping these off maybe six rounds a minute, at a key point in time in the battle, the Native Americans had these. Hmm. So we're sort of on the back side of that technological development. Now, while we're playing around with this, it's easy to not push forward a lot of of weapons development when the situation on the ground doesn't dictate it. For the most part, the trapdoor is good for dealing with Native American tribes. But we start to embark upon expansion. And when we start to embark upon expansion, when you got, start to get the, uh, the reforms of the Army that you guys discussed before, the Army itself realizes that it's sort of behind the power curve when it comes to big Army. That becomes evident in 1886, because in 1886, the French fill the new weapon. And the reason that they fill the new weapon is because a Frenchman named Paul Viel in 1884 had invented smokeless powder. Now, what's cool about smokeless powder? Well, well it has a lot less smoke, right? When you fire black powder, what happens? What do you see? Smoke. So you got a problem. It, it obscures the battlefield. Okay. Any other advantage of smokeless powder? Yeah, you're going to start to talk about the invisible battlefield. That while there still is a signature that comes here, it's much smaller. So it's going to be hard for the enemy to pick up where you are. What's the biggest increase or, or reason that you go with this? The power. Black powder has limitations. Smokeless powder rapidly burns. It increases the velocity of the round. And if you increase the velocity of the round, what else are you doing? You're going to increase the range of the round. Also, you're going to flatten the trajectory. If you fire these Civil War rifles at 600 meters, you're doing almost indirect fire because of the arc. These things have a relatively flat, tra flat trajectory, so I can train Joe a lot easier. When I go with the increased range, these weapons are now sighted at 11, 12, 1300 meters, 2000 meters. 
So now, in the hands of trained marksmen, the beaten zone on the battlefield is going to rapidly increase. And the minute that the French take this cartridge and made it to this weapon, every other infantry rifle in the world is obsolete. Now what do we know is going to happen next? Progress, or what we call an arms race. We can't have the, the rotten French out there with better weapons than everybody else, so the U.S. Army starts to scramble. And after a number of uh, tests, they ultimately decide to go with the Danish design, the Krag Jorgens. Now, this is a bolt-action rifle, so it's actually an improvement over some of the stuff that the French have. That uh, 1886 Lebel rifle has a seven-round tubular magazine, but you've got to be careful. The heat will build up from the barrel and will start to affect the spring. What the Krag Jorgensen does is tries to eliminate that. So rather than have a tubular magazine, you now have a magazine on the side that will hold five rounds. Now what the soldier has to do is load each one of those rounds into the magazine, close it up. This is a very smooth operating breach that falls apart when you're not careful. Okay? Now, you're still worried about Joe blowing off his basic load. So the Army decides to put a little switch on the side that the officer and the sergeant can readily see to tell whether or not this has got the magazine cut off on. With this lever is up, you have an interrupter that keeps rounds from loading from the magazine into the chamber. And when it's in this position, the sergeant and the officer can control the rate of fire because the soldier then has to load one round a minute. And only in an emergency, under the orders of a sergeant or the officer, will you flip it down to enable the soldier to fire all the magazine. Okay? Now, this will be our standard regular Army infantry weapon going into the Spanish-American War. And it'll also be the one that we have in the Philippine insurrection. Here's our problem. When we get to Cuba in 1898 with our very cool new Krag Jorgen rifle that we adopt in 1892, so just a few years later, it's hot off the presses. When we get to Cuba, we find that the Cubans, or correction, the Spanish, are armed with this. The 1893 Mauser. Those crazy Mauser brothers of Germany have taken that bolt action idea to its logical conclusion. They have strengthened the lugs on the bolt so I can have more pressures, more pressure, more velocity, greater range. But the biggest thing that those Mauser brothers did was put the magazine on the inside, an internal box magazine and then take five rounds and put them on a stripper clip. Their little ears milled in the top of the receiver here. All the soldier has to do to reload the weapon is line up the rounds with those clips, push them with their thumbs, the rounds go off the stripper clip into the magazine, and you reloaded this weapon with five rounds in about two and a half, three seconds. That means soldiers armed with this Mauser system can get off 15 to 20 aim shots a minute. While the Americans are waiting for old Sarge to tell them to turn off the magazine cutoff. This comes as a shock to us. And while that Krag Jorgens is a beautiful weapon, it's one of the shortest lived in American history. By 1903, it's out of the inventory. So 11 year run and it's gone. Its replacement is one of the most elegant and beautiful weapons we've ever designed the 1903 Springfield. Now, this is an uh, improvement for us. Prior to this, all of our weapons had a carbine version for the cavalry guys and a regular big version for the infantry. With the breakthrough when it comes to the velocity, I can cut all that out. So this is the first one that's issued to all soldiers, regardless of branch. It's got a beautiful magazine system. It looks a lot like the Mauser. It's got a beautiful bolt system. It looks a lot like the Mauser. In fact, these two things look so much like the Mauser that the Mauser company sues the U.S. government for copyright infringement. And we are actually paying on those copyrights until 1917 when we go to war against the Germans. Now, the interesting thing is, is this weapon retains the magazine cutoff because we're still not sure about Joe 
and ammo conservation. But the weapon is relatively light, right around eight pounds, and it'll drive tacks all day long. When the United States enters World War I in April 1917, this is the standard weapon for the National Guard and the regular Army. Unfortunately, this is only being made in one place, the Springfield Arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. And when the Army goes to Springfield Arsenal and says, hey, we're probably going to have to raise an army of four million men, the superintendent says, that's nice. What are you going to arm them with? The reason that this thing is so nice and elegant is it is damn near handmade. I can't ramp up production to give you the number of weapons that you want. Now, Otto Bismarck, the great chancellor of Germany, has a saying. He said, God has a special providence for drunks, children, and the United States of America. So here, when we don't have enough weapons to arm our soldiers, we sort of get lucky. When the war breaks out in 1914, the British Army is actually considering getting rid of their Lee Enfield to go with what they call the Pattern 14. The problem is, once you go to war, you can't afford to take a lot of your production offline, building the Lee Enfield, to switch to building this Pattern 14. So they turn to the United States and say, hey, Remington and Winchester, can you build these weapons for us under contract in caliber 303? And they start building them. And when Springfield Arsenal can't make enough of those 1903s, the Army turns to Spring, uh, Remington and Winchester in 1917 and says, hey, can you take that British rifle that you're building, rechambering it from 303 to our standard 30-06 and mass produce it? Fortunately, they can. So when it comes to war, sometimes the coolest weapon isn't what you get. It's what you can make. Now, take a look at this. The Pattern 17 is about a pound and a half heavier and it's about four inches longer. Which one would you want to carry? Oh, hell yeah, the other three. But you know what Uncle Sugar tells you, right? Take what we give you or throw rocks. 70% of the American soldiers in World War I will actually carry this weapon. This will be our weapon. In fact, if you've ever seen the movie Sergeant York, Sergeant York is, of course, carrying one of these. But Sergeant York was a draftee in the 82nd Division, and all draftees divisions were equipped with this. It's a handy weapon. It's an effective weapon. It's not an elegant weapon. But because of the realities going on in the battlefield, that's what we could do. Now, there's some other changes that come around on the battlefield, too, at this time. In the Industrial Revolution, you start to get some of these sort of eccentric but inventive guys. And one of these extrinsic inventive guys is an American named Hiram Maxim. Now, the idea of rapid fire weapons are, again, almost as old as firearms. In fact, who's heard of a Gatling gun? Yeah, everybody's heard of a Gatling gun. How did that work, though? How did it operate? Yeah, your guns, baby. It was hand cranked. So that is manually operated. Hiram's an interesting guy. He's a self-trained electrical and mechanical engineer. I don't think he gets more than about a sixth grade education. Okay? But because of the time and the place, those credentials didn't matter as much. It's what you could come up with. So he's got a number of patents under his belt. In fact, in 1884, he is in Europe to receive an award for his work in electricity. While he's there, he runs into an old friend of his. And the friend says, in one of my favorite quotes of history, Hiram, hang your electricity. If you want to make a barrel of money, invent something that will allow these Europeans to slit each other's throat with greater facility. Now Hiram, being a good American, wanted to make a barrel of money and liked the challenge. He goes back into his workshop, and now that you've got that uh, smokeless powder cartridge, you've got some power. Two years later, 1886, he comes out with the Maxim gun the world's first true automatic weapon. Now, this is the MG-08. It's the standard German machine gun of World War I. But it's basically Maxim's design. And Maxim's design, with slight variations, will be the weapons that equip 
the Russians in World War I, the Germans in World War I, uh, the British Vickers gun is just an improvement on this, and even some of the weapons that the Americans are using. What, does, what he does to turn this into automatic fire is to use physics. Isaac Newton. Each action has an equal but opposite reaction. Let's use the explosion of that round as the force to get automatic fire. So I load around into the chamber. On the side here is a big spring. It's connected to the bolt. The round in the chamber fires. That creates a recoil. So the recoil is pushing back the bolt. The big screen catches it, slams it back into battery. You've automated the process. You automatically fire, eject, reload the next one. And once you automate fire, this weapon system is capable of six to 700 rounds per minute. When your infantryman is getting off, 15 to 20 rounds per minute. Now, is there a downside to fire in six to 700 rounds a minute? Heat. In fact, when you get that much heat, you know it's going to be a problem. That over time what happens is the heat starts to expand the parts until they jam or the barrel starts to melt down. Now again, Maxim's a smart guy. What he does is takes the barrel, wraps it in this hollow metal jacket, fills the jacket full of water. That's why this is called a water-cooled machine gun. As the barrel starts to heat up, the water dissipates the heat. Problem solved. Ooh, except after about 700 rounds, the water in the jacket starts to boil. And if you don't find a way of dealing with that, you're only going to delay the amount of time it takes before this thing jams. Again, Maxim's a smart guy. What he does is takes some radiator hose right underneath the barrel here. There's a little water cock valve. You put the radiator hose there, and you take it and put it into a metal can, a condenser can, okay? Weapon starts to fire, 700 rounds. The water starts to boil, it turns to steam. The steam then travels down the hose into the bucket where it recondenses into water. Now this is not a closed system. In other words, once it cools down, it's not getting sucked back in. After about 750 rounds, you have to stop firing and there's a little thumb screw valve back here. You have to unscrew it Put a little funnel in, pour the water back in. But as long as you have fresh water and you have these belts of ammunition, this puppy will fire forever. In fact, arguably, that water-cooled system is still one of the most reliable machine gun designs ever made. Now, while it is capable of 600, 700 rounds, the actual rapid rate of fire in, uh, in, in World War I and beyond is 250 rounds, one box of ammunition. Now, I'll tell you what, let's, let's see if we can get this shown a little bit easier. Can I get two guys to come up here and give me a hand? Yeah, come on. Come on, come on down. You again. Okay, hey, just take this damn thing and put it here on the ground, will you? Put my machine gun down before you break it. How heavy is that thing? Oh, not, not no problem with me, right? 30, 40 pounds, that thing. 30, 40 pounds. Go ahead, guys. This German machine gun weighs 124 pounds. That's just the gun. The water itself, of course, as you're carrying it, is going to weigh another 15 pounds or so per jug of water you're carrying. If you're firing 250 rounds per minute, rapid rate of fire, each one of those boxes of ammunition weighs another 10 to 15 pounds. Problem? Yeah, that's a lot of guys doing it, right? That's a lot of problems. Uh, and we talked about this in the World War I class. Hey, what if I'm defending in my trench? What do you think about the weight? <laughs> Who cares, right? It ain't going anywhere. I've got it set up. I have stockpiled the water. I've stockpiled the ammunition. I can go shooting all day long. How about the attacker? What do you look like carrying a 125-pound machine gun across no man's land? A big slow target. Please insert bullet here. Okay. 
So we got a problem, and you realize it. The technology is giving a little bit more primacy to the defender over the attacker. And you look at some of the technology that comes out in World War I, it is going to push forward our ideas of tactics and doctrine. You're going to start to try to develop more weapon systems to deal with this reality. One of the first responses is this. This is the 1915 Shosho gun. It's the world's first mass-produced automatic rifle. Now, how many 1915 Shosho guns do you have in 1914? That'd be none, because you don't need it till you know you need it. And the idea behind this is to deal with the immobility of these other weapons. What I'm trying to do is give the infantrymen some mobile automatic fire. And it's supposed to be walking fire, just like this. As I go forward, every second time my foot hits, I fire off the trigger with a five-round burst. And the idea is the attacking infantry now has something that suppresses the defender long enough to give me a hope in hell of crossing no man's land. This is an interesting design, much reviled. It goes from the design board to full production in six months. Now, who's ever heard of an F-35 fighter? How long have we been building that puppy? A long time. You seen any of them lately? Exactly. You're going from full production in six months because in war, more than anything else, necessity is the mother of invention. Now, this is being made in a bicycle factory in Paris. You can sort of see the big tubular design. Who's building it, by the way? Yeah, but who? <laughs> hey, this is a total war. In a total war, you mobilize every segment of society. And so you are trying to find the best person for the best place. I got to keep enough guys in the field making the food. I got to keep enough guys in the factory building the weapons. And I got to have enough guys in the trenches. So what we see in a lot of these uh, wartime production is the place of some of that skilled worker is being taken by women, by adolescents and old guys like me, okay? Now, how many show show guns do you think the average woman in the French factory has built prior to 1915? That, that'd be none, okay? So this is on the job training. I have a design that is thrown in relatively quick. It's being made in some cases by unskilled labor. And then you've got army who gets to say their say. This is a two-man weapon. One guy's the gunner but it's got a 20-round magazine, and you'll empty that 20-round magazine on full auto in less than 10 seconds. So you've got the assistant gunner with nothing but bags and bags and bags of the spare magazines. And some bright guy gets an idea. Hey, let's make it easier on the assistant gunner to keep up the rate of fire. Let's take and cut a big hole in the side of the magazine. That way, the assistant gunner knows when you're out. Any problem with that? Mud. Mud in World War I? Who could have heard of it? Okay. Uh, now, this weapon gets a horrible reputation with the American soldiers. And because of the state of our weapons uh, system, our weapons uh, infrastructure, the vast majority of our small arms, our uh, squad automatic rifles, and even our machine guns, we get from the British and the French. It's not until very late in the war that the American BARs and all come out. And the American soldier hates this thing, mostly because the American soldiers in World War I are horribly trained. The French have a lot fewer problems with it because the French say this is a weapon that requires tender love and care, a lot of cleaning. Be very careful with the magazine. The American soldier with a little training gets this, and the minute it jams, you throw it away and get a rifle. There's problems, but at least the idea is there. Now, World War I is going to start to push you through some other weapons designs, too. If you look at the trenches, they're about six and a half, seven foot wide. And when it comes to clearing of trenches, if you have a bolt-action rifle, of course, you've got some limitation. What would be sweet would be to have a full automatic weapon. But a full automatic weapon like that Shosho gun, that's just sort of hard to maneuver in the trenches. So first the Italians, but then later perfected by the Germans, come up with this new weapon called a submachine gun. The submachine gun, this is the, uh, 
1927, 1928 Thompson gun. It's ultimately what we come up with. It's based upon the idea that the Germans have. Let's give the infantry guys in that close quarters combat a trench broom. You get in there, by definition, a submachine gun fires a pistol cartridge, in this case a 45, and at least in the early ones, full automatic fire. So I come in and I'm sweeping down the trench as I go. Hmm, okay. Now as you start to get into the 1920s, 1930s and World War II, you start to see these being equipped by specialist troops, airborne soldiers because they're going to need the close assault, but also increasingly by officers and NCOs. Why? Okay, you can do that. Why else? What do I want my officers and NCOs doing? Commanding. If I give you something with a pistol cartridge, unless you're really close, you can't hurt anybody. So if I give you something that can't hurt anybody, unless you're really close, it encourages you to not be really close. But it'd be sweet if I could give my infantrymen at least a little bit more rate of fire. And the Army is playing around with this idea in the 1920s and the 1930s. And ultimately, in 1936, they try to solve that firepower problem. I don't want to give everybody automatics because, again, that burns up a lot of ammo. But I'd like to increase the rate of fire of what we had over the bolt action. The ultimate design comes out here and is adopted in 1936 by the Army, the M1 Garand. This is a beautiful weapon. Okay? It is gas operated. So I'm not using the recoil that you see here. John Moses Browning had come up with this idea at the turn of the century. If you take this cartridge and fire it, it's creating some super hot, super fast moving gas behind it. And if you can tap the power of that fast moving gas, you can actually start to operate the system. So underneath these gas operated, you've got an open port that drives a piston. There's a little hole drilled in the barrel here. As the bullet goes past that hole, enough of that fast moving gas is siphoned off to move the action. The Grand is semi-automatic. The Grand fires, what did I just do with it? Ah, here we go. An eight round in block clip. So the sergeant, soldier pulls it back, you put the clip in and it slams. If you want to have fun with a World War II or Korean War veteran, Ask them to talk to you about M1 thumb. Okay. So you got to be fast. The United States, by the end of World War II, is the only nation who gives every one of their infantry soldiers either a full automatic or a semi automatic weapon. Our foes, the Japanese and the Germans, the majority of their infantrymen are armed with five shot bolt action weapons. So, in theory, we have given our guys a big advantage. Now, any downside of this weapon? It requires a lot more maintenance, a lot more loggies. Any other problem? It's relatively heavy, okay? Oh, oh, there's a built-in thing. You stick this in, and the little clip stays inside the weapon. You fire, 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 fire. On the eighth round, the clip ejects, okay? Yeah, and, and on stony ground and stuff, when it hits the ground, it goes, ka-ting, 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 which does what? Oh, no, I'm unloaded. The Japanese figure this out pretty quick. They're counting rounds, pop, 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 ka-ting, closely followed by bonsai, okay? That scares the hell out of the Americans in the beginning, but the Americans are always pretty resilient. They start to figure this out, and so you have buddy teams together, and the soldiers are counting this off too. Pop, 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 you get around five, you say, hey, Bob, I'm about out. Okay, he stops firing. You fire off the other two rounds, pop, 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 and ka-ching, ka-ching, followed by bonsai, followed by your buddy going pop, 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 okay? So, you know, the soldiers are learning. Now, we're going to play around with some other weapons, too. This is the M1 carbine. Uh, so it's a kickback to the old carbines. I need a light weapon for guys like artillerymen who should be a weapon of last resort, and also officers and NCOs, because, come on, guys, do your job. I've given you something that's really only good for close defense, better than a pistol, so I go with an intermediate cartridge. It's bigger than a pistol, but smaller than a rifle. 
We issue these in World War II, but they'll also be issued in Korea, and even in the early days of Vietnam. Okay? Any problem with this weapon? It won't stop anything. I had a buddy of mine, John Serprin. His father was a Korean War veteran, an infantryman. He said the minute that they got out of the line in Korea, everybody in the unit's carrying these. Because they're light. But the minute they got orders to go back into the line, these things disappeared, and the M1s came back out. The Germans are sort of seeing some of the same stuff here. They're trying to come up with that same firepower things that the Americans do. And in World War II, they're going to come up with some very interesting weapon systems to deal with their dynamics. One of the first ones is this, the MG-34. This is the world's first multi-purpose machine gun. What that means is, depending on the mount I use, changes how it's used. So in my quad pod, which looks a lot like that, it's the, the company heavy weapon. With a bipod like this, it's the squad weapon. This is the coax on most of their armored vehicles. It's also the commander's weapon on most of their vehicles. So in one handy dandy design, I'm accomplishing a lot of stuff. Now, you will notice the big improvement over this puppy is it comes in at about 27 pounds. I might bit lighter than this puppy, but this can fire eight to 900 rounds a minute. Whoo, that's pretty impressive. How do you do that? How can you get a weapon that's light and yet still has a massive rate of fire? Okay, it's belt fed. How else? Why is this damn thing so heavy? Ah, this is air-cooled. Problem with air-cooled? Ah, those crazy Germans have come up with an idea. On the side of the weapon here, there's a little switch. You push down the switch, you turn, you slap out the hot barrel, your assistant gunner, with an asbestos missing, by the way, slaps in the new one, and you're ready to rock and roll. Ooh. Based upon the German experience in Poland, they also changed their doctrine and organization. In Poland, they found out that far too many of their soldiers and officers were not exercising initiative. That when the bullets started to fly, the command process slowed down. And the Germans, because of their strategic situation, had to get the initiative in battle. And it had to have initiative at the lowest possible level. So between the end of the Polish campaign and the beginning of the French campaign in May of 1940, they fundamentally changed their infantry squad organization. Rather than to keep these things up at the weapons platoon of the company, now every squad in the German army is built around this. Nine-man squad plus an NCO built around this. You change your tactics. Now the whole squad exists to defend this weapon or to enable this weapon to maneuver the rifleman. Hmm. Now, the Germans hit on something else. Every army, we can argue, consists of three elements. You've got your feeders, you got your fodder, and you got your fighters, right? So when you get your feeders, those guys, thank God, they're the smallest element of most army, are absolutely worthless. The only thing they do is feed on your rations and accomplish nothing else. The fodder makes up the mass majority of your organization, right? They're not bad guys, so they want to do the right thing, but because of lack of training or ill luck or whatever, the best you can hope out of these guys is that they may hit a couple of enemy before, well, they take one themselves, right? The smallest portion of your army, no more than about 10 to 15 percent, are the true fighters, the steely-eyed killers. You guys agree with that? from your own experience? I mean, our training is designed to make all those fighters, right? It depends on the branch. Uh, the Germans are sort of going with that assumption. True. 
that professional armies, in theory, still uh, are able to do the training to make everybody into f fighters. But even then, we, if we're honest with ourselves, all of you have been in organizations where you knew who the studs were, right? <laughs> Usually after they went to war, you figured out who the studs were. And they still were relatively small in number. When you design this weapons team, the German training is designed to find the fighter, find the steely-eyed killer. And when you find the steely-eyed killer in the squad, what do you do? You give him that thing. Now, we can go back and forth on this. Have you guys read Dave Grossman on killing? Uh, or have you read SLA Marshall, Men Against Fire? They have some of these same arguments. Anybody ever read? Show of hands. SLA Marshall, Men Against Fire. Okay, this is one of the most important documents written for the U.S. Army in the last 60 years. Marshall makes some controversial arguments. He says that uh, based upon his oral interviews of infantrymen, mostly in the Pacific, relatively limited, less than 20% of U.S. infantrymen fired their weapons in battle. Boy, that's pretty shocking. That sort of goes with that feeder and fighter thing, right? Uh, now, it's interesting that a lot of his arguments have been disproven. And personally, every time you see a World War II infantryman, ask him. And when I've asked World War II infantrymen, they said, oh, no, we fired all the time. We weren't aiming. We weren't hitting anything, but by God, we were shooting. But one of the things that Marshall said that I think is probably true is that invariably in these infantry organizations, the crew serve weapons almost always fired. Why? Okay. Hey, when, uh, when you're in battle, if an infantry guy, the minute you take fire, what do you do? You get down and make sweet, sweet love to Mother Earth, right? When do you get back up? When do you, who decides when you get up? No, usually you do. The individual infantry guy, right? Because old Sarge is way over there. On that German nine-man plus an NCO infantry squad, Where's the NCO in this battle? He's with the MG-34 directing it. So not only do you have direct leadership on your most potent weapon, enabling initiative, encouraging the riflemen to move forward, because when that thing goes off, everybody knows it. And what will encourage Joe to get up is when the other guy ain't shooting back at you. But there's also that social dynamic. If I'm hiding in my hole, I can easily come out after the battle and go, oh, yeah, that was bad. I killed about 50 of them. And nobody's going to call you, right? On the crew serve weapon, you're all around your buddies. You can't bullshit yourself or others. So you're going to fire. Now, the problem, of course, with this is the problem with a lot of German stuff. It's over-engineered. And when you get in the war, you don't expect a mass attritional total war. You find out that this thing is too well made. You can't mass produce it. So in 1942, the Germans come out with an improvement, the MG-42. This thing is a buzzsaw. It has a cyclic rate of fire of 1,200 rounds a minute. It produces a unique signature. You cannot hear individual rifle shots. This thing has such a psychological effect that the U.S. Army in 1943-44 actually produces movies to try to uh, acclimatize Joe to the sound so they won't be as afraid. They call it Hitler's buzzsaw. Uh, some of the more indelicate ones call it the fart of death. <laughs> now, you can make a lot of more of these because this weapon uses a lot of welded and stamped parts. Okay? Now, you decide to help the creation here because you're also going to make it easier quick change barrel. You slap this down, it levers out the barrel, you slap the one back in. And when you're fighting on the eastern front against hordes of Russians, that's a pretty effective weapon. In fact, it's so effective that to some extent it influences the design of our M60 machine gun in the 1950s. Uh, and after the war, the new Bundeswehr will take this weapon, put a governor on it, because we can't afford to fire 1,200 rounds a minute, and issue it out first as the MG1 and then later as the MG3. And if you've ever done the shoots and snare with a Bundeswehr, you've probably fired the covering down weapon of this. So they've got some pretty good weapons. 
And they're going to come up with some new concepts. And the new concept they're going to come up with next starts, again, not with a weapon, but with the cartridge. German actual battlefield experience shows that our rifles can reach out and hit somebody at 1,200 meters. The reality on the battlefield is you're never going to see anybody at that range. Most of the fights are going to occur at four to three, three to 400 meters. So working on that uh, is a guy named Hugo Smizer, who was also one of the creators of the first submachine gun. What they start to do is come up with a Kurtz cartridge. Kurtz is German for short. So I'm going to try to get the same relative size of the rifle cartridge, roughly 30 caliber, but a neck down cartridge with enough power to reach out and pop guys at three, 400, 500 meters easily. Now, since I lighten up that cartridge, now the soldiers can carry a lot more of them. The cartridge comes well before the weapon, and the weapon that they ultimately put it in is this one. This is the MP44. This is the world's first assault rifle. By definition, assault rifle has selective fire, so I can fire single shot, semi-automatic, but when the situation dictates, I slap down the lever and go full auto. It's an interesting history of this one, though, that also shows how politics can influence weapons design. Once you get into the total war in 1942, there is a concern that Germany is producing too many different types of weapons. And old Adolf Hitler decides, hey, I want to make sure that we don't make any more different types of rifles and stuff. We got enough. If the infantry rifle bolt action was good enough for me in World War I, it should be good enough for these guys. Problem is, when you get to war against the Russians, you need some different firepower advantages, especially in that close-in fight. And starting in 1942, the German army starts to take that Kurtz cartridge and build a weapon around it. But they got to hide some of this from der Fuhrer. So the first one of these is called the Machine Carbine 42. They make a limited number, and they send it to the Eastern Front, and the guys generally like it, okay? But to hide the fact that you're going to start producing more of these from the Fuhrer, in 1943, you call it the Machine Pistola, the Machine Pistol, the Submachine Gun 43. Because Hitler likes machine guns, submachine guns, because they're cool. But this is one of those weird things that happens. Occasionally, you know, old Adolf wants to do the good old, you know, tap the war heroes on the back. So in 43, late 43, uh, he is decorating a couple of soldiers for their heroism on the Eastern Front. And like he always likes to do, he taps them on the back and says, is there anything I can do for you guys? And they say, we want some more of those MP43s. And he goes, what? What MP43? What's going on here? Old Albert Speer, the industrial war minister, had sort of hidden this stuff, and he starts to go through the roof until Spear sort of talks him down and talks through the advantage of this thing. And at the end, you say, okay, we'll mass produce it as the MP44, but give it a cool name. The Stromgewehr, the Storm Rifle. And so this is what comes out of it. 30-round magazine, welded and stamped parts so you can make a lot of them, Easily deadly within 300 meters. It's given the Germans some major firepower advantage. Fortunately for the Allies, it comes too short. Too few of them at the end of the war. But the idea of the assault rifle starts to catch on. The Russians see the advantage of this right off the bat. They capture some of this. Now, there's a guy named Kalishnikov. Maybe you've heard of him. Okay. Kalishnikov says, I never saw any of those MP44s. I don't know what you're talking about. But what we do know is the Germans, or the Russians, captured a number of those cartridges. And just like the Germans, they started to make the cartridge long before they had the rifle. They see the advantage of it. The first weapon they adopt um, is the SKS. Semi-automatic weapon using that 762 by 39 that little cartridge. And they actually get enough of these, just a small number of them, into the fight in Berlin in 1945. 
But they see the potential of this MP44. And Kalishnikov, two years after the war, comes out with this weapon. How many of you are familiar with this? I'm just asking. Anybody been shot at with one of these? Of course, they have nothing in common, right? Nothing at all. This is an interesting idea. You take a Russian weapon. There are cultural things involved with it. If you ever pick up an AK-47, do this. Hey, if you pick up an M4 carbine and do this, what do you hear? Freedom. <laughs> right? You don't hear a lot of rattling and rolling. Why not? Because our tolerances are very tight. And our tolerances are very tight because... We have well-trained soldiers from a modern industrial society. You can give them more uh, weapons that require a lot more maintenance and stuff, and they'll run with it. The assumption of this rifle, like most Russian rifles, is <laughs> it's going to be in dirt, it's going to be in mud, it's going to be in snow, it's going to be in the hands of guys that maybe don't have a lot of training. But the funny thing about this weapon, when it's in the mud and it's in the snow and it's in the dirt, what happens? It still shoots. How much recoil is in this weapon? Very little. This quickly becomes the most popular, most mass-produced weapon in human history because it's relatively easy in design, and I can give it to almost anyone, and with very little skill sets, they can become deadly with it, as you guys are probably well aware. And if Joe doesn't clean it, if Joe drops it in the mud, it'll still go boom. Now, while the Russians are coming out with this, we'll talk about the last weapon that we play around with. And to some extent, it's supposed to be our response to these assault weapons. It's the M14. Look familiar? Yeah, sort of like an M1 with a little steroids put on it. The idea behind this is to replace a whole bunch of other weapons. If I field this, it's going to replace the M1 Garand, it's going to replace the submachine gun. And because I have a different selector system here, and I have them back in the arms room, I put a different selector in, now this becomes an automatic rifle. Put a bipod on, it replaces the BAR. The biggest reason you have an M14 is because you don't want to lose jobs at Springfield Arsenal. And when you issue the M14 in the era of the AK-47, you got some problems that become apparent. Anybody ever fired one of these? Okay. It's got the NATO cartridge. If you fire it on full automatic, it does this. Ah! So while it's a good idea to give jobs back home, when it actually comes to military development, it's sort of a dead end. And it uh, goes to Vietnam in 1964, 1965, 1966, and it's rapidly replaced by the M16. Quick and dirty, we have talked about several, several centuries of military firearms development. What are your questions? <laughs> <laughs>